So uh, my main uh, domain of interest is uh, quantum chaos, which is part of PDEs, okay, or at least uh, uh, the study of quantum models uh, such that the classical limit is chaotic. And in this framework, we have come across uh, some strange, uh, originally a little strange uh, uh, spectral feature, which was called then fractal vilo, which I will try to explain. And then in the second part of the talk, I will, uh, I will let's say, uh, play a bit with some toy models. And these toy models involve some specific directed graphs or that directed networks. And this is what I, I would... I will try to explain. So <coughs> uh, somehow this, this application of these ideas from quantum chaos to, to directed graphs, it's a, it's a sort of pet, pet problem uh, for myself, which I asked uh, to myself a few, few years ago. And somehow it has developed very slowly. So it has developed uh, together with two uh, former master students, uh, Quentin Gendron and Justin Trias. Uh, for, first of all, yes, my, my, my work on fractal vilo for quantized chaotic systems uh, mostly started with the help of uh, Maciek Zvorsky from Berkeley. So but there was no graph involved, there was no network involved at that time. So the, the little toy model with the graphs came up with some master students. And I, was, I also have, a, now, nowadays, I also have a postdoc, Mustafa Sabri in Orsay, uh, with whom I, I plan to work on this a little bit. Okay, so on this picture, you can see on the left side, you will see this is called the Baker's map. Okay, it's a, it's a transformation on the on a square on the torus, if you want, on the square. It's a chaotic transformation. It's an open transformation because because some of the points disappear. Okay, and so this this will make uh, this will make up a, a toy model, a first series of toy models, and then from this toy model we'll end up with toy models uh, uh, described in terms of uh, directed graphs. Okay, this was the, the right an example is the one one on the left. So I, I will try to to tell you about this about this project. So. I don't know if this has any, any connection uh, with the uh, Google Matrix or <coughs> Google Matrix analysis, so that uh, probably the talk of uh, uh, Klaus Fram this morning could, could answer a little bit to this question. But, uh, well, I, I will mostly uh, study this specific model and tell you what, what we will try to do about this. Okay, so where does this idea of fractal vilo come from? It comes from uh, scattering problems in PDEs, okay, in, uh, in wave mechanics, if you want. So if you study waves, propagation of waves through the wave equation, uh, uh, outside some obstacles, so you have some obstacles, okay, which have various shapes, and outside of these obstacles, you propagate waves. This is uh, described by the wave equation, okay, this equation here, with initial con some initial conditions. And if you are interested in the long time behavior of the wave, okay, how do they propagate, what happens at long times, if you focus on what happens at long time in some bounded region, uh, you want since this is a linear equation, if you want to understand long times, you have to look at the spectrum. Okay, this is the first, uh, somehow the first reflex uh, one should have. And when you look at the spectrum of the Laplacian, it is, it is uh, on L2, on the L2 space of the complement of the, of the obstacles. The spectrum is, uh, let's say, it's, uh, it, currency, it, it is a real line. Okay? So when I say the spectrum, it means uh, here I, I take the square root of the eigenvalue. Sorry, the spectrum is like, it corresponds to taking the resolvent uh, Laplacian plus lambda squared okay, for some, some reason. So if you look at <coughs> the spectrum this way, there is a continuous spectrum here on the real line. But uh, in general, you can propagate, you can, you can take the Green's function, the, the resolvent of, this, of the operator, and you can uh, continue it analytically across the real, real axis. And what you get, you get when you look at the analytic continuation, the meromorphic continuation, you find poles of finite multiplicities which are called resonances. Okay. And these resonances, so I call them lambda j, these resonances, lambda j, they impact the long time behavior of the wave. Okay? In this way, okay, there is a, in some sense, there is an expansion okay, in terms of these resonances. So here I just look at the resonances above a certain line. And these resonances impact the long time behavior. And this is why we are interested in the distribution of these resonances, uh, these complex values, generalized eigenvalues. They could see, be seen as generalized eigenvalues of the Laplacian. Okay. Okay, so this is where this, this pop up. And <coughs> so for this reason, we are interested in the, the counting or at least studying the distribution of these resonances, especially in the high frequency limit. Okay, when you take high frequencies, so you go along the, the real axis and you, you take little, little boxes uh, below the real axis, you want to count, for instance, how many of the resonances are in this box, because the number here would be important when you try to write down such, a, such an expansion, expansion such a, a high frequency expansion. Okay. And so the question is about what the question came up of counting these, these objects. In general, there is no explicit expression. There is no approximate expression for these values. So you, but sometimes you can still get some information about the counting function. Okay? And this is where these, these, uh, <coughs> somehow this fractal value came, came, uh, uh, came across. So 
type of question we can ask how many are there or is, is there a gap for instance we are sometimes also interested in the presence of a gap that is a band here without any such such resonances and in this high frequency limit it is natural to connect this wave mechanics with classical mechanics or ray dynamics the ray mechanics that is you follow classical rays okay you follow the rays of uh, of light if you want or okay or bounce which bounce back and forth from the from the uh, the obstacle and, and then bounce to infinity so you have to understand the dynamics of rays because high frequency means that uh, you want to you can describe things in terms of rays so <coughs> and for this long time study what happens at long time it is natural to consider trapped rays that is the rays which get trapped forever between these obstacles okay so the idea is that somehow these trapped rays will impact in the high frequency limit these trapped rays will impact the distribution of these resonances and <coughs> what people came out okay was to conjecture such uh, dependence in the counting function so if we want to count the uh, resonances in such a box they should they should grow like a certain power of the lambda of the frequency but this power is a fractional power okay a fractal power and this power would be directly should be directly connected with the fractal dimension of the set of trapped trajectories okay here for instance i i plot this example when we have three obstacles okay three convex obstacles in this case one can show that the set of trapped trajectory is a fractal set okay fractal subset it has a certain fractal dimension and this dimension should impact the, the scaling law here in the counting function and so far in most models people could only show an upper bound that is that the number of resonances is bounded above by such an exponent but not from below okay so <coughs> we're trying originally we're trying to find models for which we have a better grasp on this scaling in particular prove a lower bound also on this uh, number of resonances and this is because this is a non-self-adjoint problem proving lower bounds spectral lower bounds is in general much harder than to prove uh, upper bounds okay so for this reason i mean these models are a bit too complicated for us so we looked at toy models okay and so this is where this baker came across okay so the baker's baker's transform is a transform is a well-known transformation on the on the unit square okay when you split the unit square in three three slices here and you squeeze each slice okay you push uh, vertically and you you elongate horizontally and then you stack them again one above each other okay so this is well known uh, toy model for for classically chaotic systems classically hyperbolic systems and what we did was <coughs> because we wanted to mimic, mimic some open system where particles could escape to infinity in order to mimic this escape to infinity we decided that one third of the particles after the transformation one third of the particles would escape to infinity okay so we somehow we forget all particles which are here we just erase them we send them to infinity so this keeps this gives you what we call an open map or open baker's map open because uh, somehow part, part of the particles go to infinity and this map can be very easily uh, described okay first in this uh, by these equations but they can also be described very easily if you use base free uh, numerology that is you you write you write position p and q are the coordinates here p and q let's say so q is the horizontal and p is the vertical one and <coughs> if you write these coordinates uh, in terms using base free uh, base free uh, notations so epsilon 1 epsilon 2 they are uh, digits or treats if you want digits in base in base 3 so they can take values uh, uh, 0 1 2 okay in base 3 and let's write p and q by uh, a sequence epsilon 1 epsilon 2 epsilon 3 etc to infinity and p is written by uh, epsilon prime 1 epsilon prime 2 epsilon prime so this is in this direction this is the treat uh, ternary decomposition of p here this is the ternary decomposition of q okay and you see that the transformation in this representation this map is very easy you just a shift you just shift that is you push the comma here on the right and this is non 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 zero only you keep it only provided epsilon 1 here is different from 1 okay because epsilon 1 equal to 1 corresponds to these points here which were here at the beginning okay so the rule is very simple it's a, it's just a shift and uh, keep only the symbols such that uh, epsilon 1 is different from 1 okay so it's it's a very easy decomposition and this way you can easily tell you can easily uh, look at which points do not go do never go to infinity which points are trapped forever in the future and this is this corresponds to this color code here each color corresponds to the points which are go to infinity at time zero at time one at time two at time three okay so yellow they go to, they are they go to zero at first time okay time zero or let's say time one maybe and uh, blue they go, uh, red they go to zero at time two uh, green they go to zero at time three etc okay and you see that what remains after you removed all these points what remains are the points which are trapped forever, forever in the future, which are called gamma minus, okay, for some reason. And these points, they're just made of the ternary decompositions such that this here 
the, 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 the decomposition of Q doesn't contain any value 1. Okay, so, so internal decomposition is made of two zeros and twos. Okay. And so this, okay, this trap set is a fractal set. It's the product of the Cantor set, the standard uh, one-third Cantor set okay, here, times the interval here. Okay. And the dimension of this, of this Cantor set here is well known. It's uh, log 2 over log 3. Okay, it's the Hausdorff dimension or box dimension, whatever you want. Okay. So that's a model where we control, we control very well what's going on at the classical level, at, this, at the level of this uh, classical map. Okay. Now, <coughs> this model has been quantized. Okay, of course, now what does it mean to quantize such a map? I mean, there are many ways to define what quantization is. So I just want, I just want you to believe me, to believe what I would say. Okay. There is, a, let's say, a, uh, let's say a appropriate or a reasonable way to quantize this model. Because we are on a, on a phase space which is compact, which is a square, the quantization is, is, is lives on discrete space okay, of dimension n. Okay, n is a, some large integer. So c, c to the n is the quantum space. Okay, and somehow the high frequency limit will correspond to taking n very large. And in this, in this representation, okay, uh, these states can be, can be uh, you can associate several bases, bases of states which are localized in position, bases of states which are localized in momentum, that is uh, along the, the vertical coordinate, and both are connected with each other through for discrete Fourier transform. Okay, so there are rules for this quantum, discrete quantum mechanics. Okay, this uh, we did not invent. And <coughs> using this kinematics, if you want, quantum kinematics, uh, people, I mean Balash and Boros, uh, about, uh, about almost uh, 30 years ago, they decided, they showed that this matrix is a good quantization, okay, it's a natural somehow quantization for this, uh, for this uh, Baker's map, this ba Baker transformation. So it's a, here this is the inverse Fourier transform, discrete Fourier transform dimension n. Here this is Fourier transform dimension n, n over 3. And here in the middle, there is a big block of size n over 3. Okay, and uh, here another Fourier transform. So it's, this one is block diagonal, and this is uh, just an inverse Fourier transform. Mm. So when you plot this matrix, so I'm sorry, the picture does not uh, show very well, unfortunately. You plot this matrix, you see that it is concentrated. So here I just plot the, the absolute values of the, the elements of this matrix. It is, it is uh, concentrated along these two lines. Okay. And uh, somehow, apart from these two lines, somehow the matrix elements are, are smaller. But they're not very small, but they, are, they, are, they, they decay away from these, these two lines here. Okay. So this matrix seems very simple. You know, it's just a bunch of Fourier matrices which you multiply to one another. Unfortunately, there's no way to compute the spectrum analytically. Okay. There's, no, there's essentially no way to, to, say, well, to say much about it. So if you look at the eigenvalues, uh, <coughs> well, they, they are complex eigenvalues. You can show that they live in the, inside the unit disk because uh, both matrices are subunitary, so the, the product is subunitary. Okay, so eigenvalues must lie, must be of modulus smaller than one. And the idea of now of this model is that we hope that this model should behave like the previous wave model. Okay, that at high frequency, what corresponds to high frequency for the waves corresponds here to large values of this n. n is the dimension, the quantum dimension, the quantum parameter should be large. Okay, so we we'll look at at these matrices for large and larger n and look at how the spectrum behaves. Okay. And here, the spectrum here should be uh, the connection between the spectrum and uh, the resonances of the Hamiltonian. Are we should compare the, these values here, which are the spectrum of this Baker's matrix, with these values uh, exponential of minus the resonances. Okay. So somehow the counting function now, what we were counting objects in some box uh, below the reaxis. Now we will count objects in coronas, in, coron in annulus, annuli. Okay. Annuli meaning that we look at uh, how many eigenvalues are sitting with which have a uh, uh, absolute value greater than some number r. Okay, so here r corresponds to the what was the depth of the box be before. Okay, so we, we try to count these eigenvalues out be which have modulus larger than r. Okay, and <coughs> uh, so this is our notation for the for the counting function. Okay, so the question: Do we have such a scaling law? So n is the is the uh, the size of the big matrix. This big matrix has a, a rank of order n is like two, two n over three, okay, two n, so it's of order n, and here we expect this fractal value would be the fact that the counting the large, uh, reasonably large eigenvalues, the number of large eigenvalues grows like n to the new, where uh, new is this uh, log two over log three, okay, so which means that most of the eigenvalues of the matrix are sitting very close to the origin here, very, are very small, okay. So that, that is uh, what, we, what we see here on the plot, okay, so and this is what we're trying, we're trying to show. We're trying to show that although this matrix has rank 2n over 3 of order n, the, the significant eigenvalues, the non-small non eigenvalues or non-negligible non, uh, non eigenvalues are much fewer. 
Okay, and much fewer mean like a, a different, small, a smaller power of n when n goes to infinity. And this is the content of this, uh, of this fractal uh, Vilo in this, uh, in this setting, in the setting of this, uh, this quantum map. And c of r here would be a function, some profile function, which we don't know a priori what, what to expect. Okay. So we tested, we tested this type of, uh, this type of uh, <coughs> asymptotics. Okay. Uh, let me show here. So <coughs> here we, I plot the number of eigenvalues uh, larger than r. Here this is r, this is this uh, modulus. So all these plots correspond to different values of n, okay, corresponding to these different colors. So here I, I plot n, I think, or maybe it's uh, n, n over 3, I don't remember exactly. Okay, going from 81 to 5,000. 5, it's not big numbers, but okay, we did this about uh, 15 years ago, I guess, with uh, Zvorsky. And so we see that here this is, uh, the, this is just the picture. For any n, we look at the number of eigenvalues above, above uh, r, modulus above r. And then here we rescale them by this theoretical power, that by this n to the new. Okay, we just rescale the, the, the curves here by this factor. So it's not perfect, of course. Okay, there are still a uh, lot of fluctuations, but it's more reasonable than, uh, well, than before. I mean, this is still, we could see a sort of tendency okay, that uh, these curves would m lie not too far from each other. Okay. Of course, we see some, uh, okay, this color code here is not uh, arbitrary. We, we see that if you go between there, there is a sort of arithmetic of this arithmetic of this uh, of these uh, maps because they are associated with multiplication by three. There is somehow connection. So between the color here, 100, 300, 900, etc. Each time you multiply by three, the the curves are somehow not too far from each other. So there is a scaling going on across uh, across such uh, such values of n. But uh, this is not perfect. Okay. I want just to emphasize that this type of test here of this fractal law was, was done also for other maps, okay, for other types of open chaotic maps, and it led to similar results. Sometimes the curves are better, sometimes they're okay, they're worse, but so it depends. Okay, this has but this was numerical, okay, most of the time. And and Dimash Pilonsky also did it for, for I don't remember exactly which map it was. It was opening maybe the standard map or something. <coughs> so here the ingredient was starting from a chaotic system, quantizing the chaotic system, an open chaotic system and uh, looking at the, the spectral distribution of these quantum map, quantized maps in the, uh, in the, uh, in the large, uh, in the, uh, well, not high frequency, but large n, large n limit. Okay, and trying to find some, some scaling, some strange scaling, uh, fractal scaling for the number of non-trivial eigenvalues. Okay. So, <coughs> so we have no proof, and most of the time, uh, in most of the models, people can get only upper bounds. So we were trying to find a model for which it's possible to get lower bounds. Okay. And what we did, as I said, this matrix, the matrix for the, this Baker's map, looked like this. So we just decided to remove all the entries which are not exactly on this line, on these tilted lines here. That is, keep only the black ones and, and kill, the, kill the other ones, even though they are not so small. Okay, they, they should be gray here instead of white, but on the blackboard, uh, we, on the board here, we, just, uh, we can ju just see white. Actually, they, they should be gray here. Let's erase all these gray digits, all these gray entries, and keep only the skeleton, what we could call it skeleton of the matrix. So the skeleton is just given by a discretization, if you look at this is the matrix here, a discretization of the map Q goes to 3Q on this interval. You remember that uh, one of the map, uh, the description of the, of, the, of the Baker's map horizontally was Q goes to 3Q. And when you, when you look at the graph of this map, you look at, the, 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 there would be tilted, tilted, uh, uh, tilted diagonals here like this. And what we do, our matrix is just a discretization of, this, of these tilted diagonals. Okay. So this is now our toy square model, if you want, the toy model of the toy model. Okay, replace our uh, quantum B, full quantum uh, quantum matrix by a skeleton matrix. Okay, SN, and keep only these values here, <coughs> and keep keep the values including the phases. Okay, so that's the toy model, and <coughs> uh, very okay, and, and we are quite quite uh, quite lucky about it. If we restrict ourselves to specific values of n, namely uh, powers of three. Okay, take three to the k for k uh, arbitrary uh, integer. Okay. So if you take this type of numbers, so the matrix looks like this, okay, where there are explicit values. Of course, there's still zero, a big, a big junk of zero columns in the middle. But then here you have these tilted uh, diagonals here, and you have some phases, okay, which are which are the phases which were the same as on the previous matrix, on the previous Baker's matrix, okay. So you have a matrix which has some some skeletons, some topology, if you are, not topology, but uh, let's say uh, some structure here plus some phases, okay. And again, if we look at these phases. For these numbers here, we are quite lucky because there is, at the quantum level, there's a way also to use this uh, base 3 decomposition and the fact that we have a shift, okay? Namely, for these values of the, of the dimension, of the quantum dimension, uh, you see that <coughs> such a number, such states in this quantum can be used 
by uh, decomposing this big big state into a pow tensor power. Okay, it's ju I'm just writing the fact that c to the n is the same as three c to the three tensor k. Okay, and each of the states, each of the basis states, okay, q j, j goes from zero to n minus one, could be written as uh, similarly as in the classical case. I'm just writing a number uh, integer number in base three. You can write this vector here as a tensor product of elementary elementary states in c three. Okay, so it's just a tensor decomposition. And uh, what we realize is that this, this matrix here, for these values of n, acts very nicely on this tensor decomposition. Namely, it acts through a shift and a little transformation of the, last of the first digits, which is, which is put at the, at the end. Okay? So any state in this, uh, uh, in this tensor state, in this tensor space, can be written, I mean, uh, any basis state can be written this way. And when you act on such a tensor product, you just shift the, shift the, d the, the indices here, and you put this one on the, at the end after an application of this matrix. So this is very, very simple. And once you have this uh, writing up, once you have this, uh, this uh, very nice tensor product, you see that if you take the kth power of the, our, our, our action, the kth power now is local in this tensor product, means that any tensor element here is, uh, you apply this matrix omega-3. Okay. So thanks to this, you can study, you can directly write down the eigenvalues of the matrix. Okay. The eigenvalues, they will be given in terms of the eigenvalues of these three by three matrix. Okay? No matter how k is large, how, how large k is, you can write down the eigenvalues of this big matrix from the eigenvalues of the small matrix. Okay? They are given by this uh, geometric uh, means. Okay? Some <coughs> so here I plot, for instance, some for some value of k, I mean k is equal to 10 and k is equal to 15. I plot the eigenvalues of this matrix. So the, the big matrix Sn has a large large uh, kernel here, actually a generalized kernel, of dimension 3 to the k minus 3, 2 to the k, and the non-trivial spectrum, it's of dimension exactly 2 to the k, is given by these eigenvalues here. Okay? So in, and it's, it's uh, and it restricted to an annulus, which is between lambda minus and lambda plus. Okay? And lambda minus and lambda plus are non-zero here for this matrix here, you can check. So here you can, for this model, for this very simple model, very specific model, you find such a fractal value, okay? And, and exact, you know exactly how the eigenvalues are distributed uh, <coughs> because you have explicit expressions, okay? So it's really a nice toy model. So <coughs> it was, uh, anyway, it was the first example where we had a rigorous, rigorous proof that we had this fractal rule, okay? So on the, on the other hand, the spectrum is very regular, okay? It's given by this, this expression. So you see it's, it's not like a random type of spectrum like we had before. And it depends very strongly on these matrix, this uh, small matrix here, okay? So thanks to, this, uh, thanks to this tensor product structure, somehow this tensor product structure is very rigid and uh, it boils down to computing the eigenvalues of a three by three matrix. So it is not very generic uh, in our settings. So <coughs> we wanted somehow to avoid this uh, very, very strong dependence, very, very uh, algebraic dependence on this tensor product structure. Okay? So we tried to see if we could get such a fractal law, okay, the existence of this fractal law, only looking at the, the topology in, in some sense or the geometry of this matrix. Okay? Not looking really at the phases here, the precise phases, okay? because here the phase phases are, are important. I mean, if you didn't have this regularity in the phases, you would not get this tensor product structure. So can we get rid of this, uh, of this uh, very precise phases here, but keeping just the topology of, the, of this matrix? And when I say the topology of the skeleton, I just mean uh, which entries are non-zero. Okay? So I keep the matrix, with, I, I put ones everywhere, and I see this okay, as, as an adjacency matrix. Okay? So <coughs> and from there, I want to see, can we guess something about, can we, uh, about the, spectrum of this, uh, the spectrum of this SN matrix, only looking at, uh, only looking at, the, at this topology. So when you look at this matrix and you take powers, okay, when you take high powers, as we, we, the same thing as before, we see that there will be, in the end, after power k, if you take the power k, the, the power k has exactly 3k minus 2 to the 3 to the k minus 2 to the k null columns. There will be many null columns. So originally there are only here there were only uh, three null columns. Okay, the one at the center which are killed by the by the this quantum map, and then the other ones. If you take higher powers here, higher means uh, power two. Okay, this column will will be killed, and this column will be killed. Okay, and if you are and if you look at the at n equal to two to 3 to the k for larger values of k. You will also have uh, much and more and more, more and more null columns will appear when you take higher and higher powers of this uh, of this uh, of this matrix of the, uh, this agency matrix. Okay, and from this you can get that just from the topology of the matrix, no matter what phases you put here, by taking products you will create many uh, null columns, and this will give you a low bound on the dimension of the generalized kernel. Okay, the generalized kernel, which which will be responsible for the uh, the geometric multiplicity of zero. Okay, in the kernel. 
So this will be larger or equal to 3 to the k minus 2 to the k. Okay? That's the number of null columns after you, you took the, this power here. Okay? So now what's important is that this phenomenon is not due to the tensor product. It's really due to the just the topology of this, uh, of this matrix. Okay? Where are the non-trivial non -trivial entries? Okay. So now <coughs> this type of matrix, it's quite natural to view it now as a, an adjacency matrix of a directed graph, okay? a directed network, if you want. Okay? Such that, okay, uh, <coughs> you direct the network on, on n nodes, okay, on n vertices, and uh, the, you have an edge kj if ajk is equal to 1. Okay, that's the, I think the standard way to, to view an adjacency matrix. So, <coughs> what does it mean that we can kill columns by taking powers of this, uh, this adjacency matrix? It means that if you look at the graph, so here this is for, for n equal to 9, you look at the graph, okay, this, this is the, the graph, uh, directed graph you get with a arrows uh, <coughs> we have. If you look at the graph, you see that some of the, uh, some of the nodes don't have any descendants. Okay, there's no arrow starting from here. There are arrows arriving here, but no arrow. So these here are the, the, are the, the, the columns, correspond to the columns which are here in the middle, which are killed uh, immediately after one step. Okay? And then you also have columns here. <coughs> you also have uh, edges here, which have future in these in this, uh, columns which will be killed. So let's put some, some colors. Okay? These colors correspond to the colors I had before when I was showing the, the Baker's map. Okay, so the yellow one corresponds to the one which are killed, which have no image, so they are killed after one application of one step of this adjacency matrix, and the, the blue ones they are the ones which are killed after a second application. Okay, and then if you do a higher, larger, larger number of applications, you don't kill anything anymore. Okay, so this this four one zero two three and uh, zero two six eight they are never killed, okay, there, they can, there, there will still be some, some entries of the matrix which are non-zero, okay? And uh, topologically, in, the terms, in terms of directed graph, these four, four nodes here, they make up what is called a strongly connected component, okay? It's a, it's a subgraph with such that any two points can be connected, and uh, you can always find a path going from 6 to 0, or a path going from 0 to 6, or you can always find a path going from 2 to 6, I mean, here it's obvious, but uh, <coughs> I mean, this is the definition of a strongly connected component. Okay, you can always join, always join two elements of this strongly connected component in both directions. Okay, and this corresponds to the non-null columns of uh, of a nine to, to the square. Okay, when I take a nine to the square, there are there are columns which remain, which are these columns here. Okay, so there's connection, of course, between uh, what happens for the adjacency matrix and the the topology of this uh, directed graph. <coughs> so I think. Most of you know already this, this definition of strongly connected component. And <coughs> there's a fact. So now what we can do is look at the reduced graph. Okay? That is, reduced graph means that we group, together, we group together all the elements of the uh, strongly connected component. Here, these two. We group them into a, 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 big, a big vertex. vertex okay? And we keep the arrows. We don't keep the arrows between them, but we keep the arrows with the external, external uh, nodes. Okay? And so what we get is a reduced graph like this. <coughs> and this reduced graph, by definition, because we, we grouped the, semi, uh, the, the uh, uh, strongly connected component in one, one big vertex, this graph now is what is called acyclic. acyclic. There's no cycle here in this graph. It is acyclic. Okay? And it is acyclic. <coughs> it means that uh, the fact that it's acyclic means that we can, we can draw an arrow of time. We can order the vertices such that two vertices uh, will be so that the order is compatible with the direction of the arrows. So here, for instance, I drew the arrow. They're all going down, the arrows. Okay, so I can try to, sh I can shift a bit my vertices so that the arrows still go down and there is an order, the order between the vertices. This one goes before this one, before this one, before this one, before this one. So there's just an order, okay. A time order, if you want, between the, between the different nodes of this reduced graph. And this ordering is always possible if you have a non-cyclic, non-cyclic, uh, non-cyclic graph. Okay. So once we have this order, let's order, let's use this order to write down our matrix. Our first our reduced matrix, okay? So this is now the reduced adjacency matrix corresponding to this reduced graph, okay? What I'm saying is that uh, <coughs> choosing choosing this order corresponds to a certain permutation of the of the entries, okay? Of the, the entries of this this uh, these nodes here. And up to this permutation, when you when you apply this permutation to, to be in this order, you get a matrix which is uh, lower triangular, okay, automatically. Being lower triangular really corresponds to this, the fact that this order is compatible with the arrows going down. Okay. <coughs> so now we can restore, for instance, we can restore this big 
big component here, this, S, uh, this strongly connected component, we can restore it in any, any order we want, okay? And we get, uh, we get up to a permutation of these initial indices so that uh, this matrix, the big matrix, the adjacency matrix after this permutation is block diagonal, okay? Block diagonal and each block is, is not, each non-trivial block is a strongly connected, strongly connected component, okay? And below we have some, some elements, okay, which are not, uh, uh <coughs> which are, but anything, any block on the, on the diagonal, which is non-zero, corresponds to a strongly connected component, okay? So you see now, after this permutation, of course, permutation is a <coughs> similitude, so you know that the spectrum of this matrix will be the same as the spectrum of this matrix, okay? And you can do here, I did not use at all the fact that I had phases or no phases. I just used the, the topology that is where are non-trivial, non-zero entries, okay, in this permutation. So you can do it with the, 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 with the matrix with phases, and if you do it with matrix of phases, you see that the spectrum, the non-trivial spectrum of this matrix, is contained only in these strongly connected components. Okay. So <coughs> <coughs> let's, look back, let's look back at what we had for the specific values of n. Okay, n was equal to s to the s to the 3 to the k, 3 to the k. So we'll find the same result, of course, but uh, we just we can just look at just look now at this strongly connected component, okay, the strongly connected component for this matrix, oh sorry, was this, uh, was this, uh, uh <coughs> this set of points, okay, which was, it w and it could be written in this way, okay, we'd get this matrix, okay, bef between the nodes 0, 2, 6, 8, this matrix like this, and if we put the phase, if we get back the phases, we get this matrix here, okay. So, <coughs> here, this type of graph, okay, or this type of matrix here, is called the De Bruyne graph in general, okay, on two, two components, so De Bruyne graphs, uh, they, they're constructed from nodes which can be written in some binary or ternary uh, decomposition. And here, uh, the, 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 the nodes are connected to one another under the rule that you have a, if you have epsilon 1, epsilon 2, here it corresponds to epsilon 1, epsilon 2 on two digits, okay, on two, two alphabet of two, two elements, this node goes to this node here, so which means that this one gets killed and uh, epsilon 2 here should appear as epsilon 2 here and this one is anything, okay, so you see that it corresponds to the fact that two, <coughs> uh, that each each node has two antecedents and two images. Okay, uh, ordered this way by this way. This is uh, what is called the De Bruyne De Bruyne graph. Okay, and this this structure here I plotted for n is equal to nine, but of course it works. It can do the same for any any power of uh, of three. Okay, three to the k, and you find each time for any such power you find that the graph you get has a unique uh, strongly connected component, which is a De Bruyne graph, but now with uh, with words of length k. Here I had words of length two. Now you have words of length, a, left length k, which uh, index, index the, the non-trivial nodes here, okay. And the spectrum, again, depends only, as we saw before, on the eigenvalues of this matrix here, 1, 1, 1, omega, okay, which is this, uh, the reduction, if you want, of the matrix we had before, okay. So we find, again, the same spectrum, naturally, but now <coughs> we had this, uh, this interpretation in terms of strongly connected uh, components. So, <coughs> now the obvious question is, do we, what, what, what happens, what, if, is, it, is it crucial for our result, our result that this element here is omega, that is uh, exponential 2i pi over 3, the, the uh <coughs> third root of unity, or can, could we put something else, okay? And another question, what happens if we are not exactly at this value, n to the 3 to the k, but if we, had, uh, if, we had, if we have other values, okay, because our matrices could be constructed for any values of n, or at least uh, values of n which um, are multiples of 3, and uh, what happens also for other types of directed graphs? Okay, that's the type of question we can ask. So the first and the main, the main example I would show is to make, to put some randomness, okay, to, in order to get some more generic spectrum. So randomness here will be to keep the geometry, to keep the topology or the topology of the graph, the non-zero non entries, but put random phases instead of these uh, specific values I had before, okay? So I keep the same topology, I put random phases, independent, independent random phases, okay? Let's say that they, are, they, are, they could be more general than random phases. I want them to be complex valued and I want them to be non-zero. So I take, I put phases, okay? U uniformly distributed across the unit circle. <coughs> so if you write down the, uh, you can do the same computation as before, okay? Because the topology is the same. You get, uh, uh, you get a reduced matrix, okay? Which is corresponds to this strongly connected component, which is a four by four matrix, which has independent, uh, independent random, uh, random phases here. And the spectrum, the spectral question you ask now is, uh, what is the spectrum? What can you say about the spectrum of this matrix? Okay. And you can do the same for nine, you can do the same for three to the K, or okay. you can do the same for, for other values of, of N. So the question is, what if we want to understand more the distribution of the non-trivial spectrum, 
Okay, we have to understand the distribution of the spectrum of this, these type of reduced matrices. Okay. So this is, I think, uh, well, let's say, as far as I know, a uh, new random matrix problem. So you impose the structure, you impose the, the structure of the, of the adjacency matrix, or the structure of the graph, and you just put random phases on the, on the, on the edges, on the links. Okay. So <coughs> what can you say about it? So not much uh, up to now. <coughs> there is still a, a sort of a nice feature. Nice feature is that if you look at this type of matrices, okay, so which have the spectrum of this uh, De Bruyne graph, or at least look, look like, they are also the numbers are non-zero and sort of tilted diagonals. And you when you take our, this matrix times its uh, adjoint, okay, you find a block diagonal matrix, okay, and that helps a lot. You find that the R times uh, R dagger is <coughs> block diagonal with blocks of size two by two, okay. So it's a block diagonal matrix, and these matrices, so each block is. Uh, is made of phases, it's, is made of combinations of these phases and combination of independent phases. So each block is independent of the other blocks. Okay, they're independent of one another and you find, uh, so the, you have a way to analyze the eigenvalues of this, the statistics of the eigenvalues of this, this matrix R R star. And the, uh, the eigenvalues of this matrix gives you the statistics of the singular values of this matrix. So you, ha you have access to the statistics of the singular values of this, uh, of this matrix. Okay, and this gives you already some non-trivial information. Okay. Because the singular values, they, they are nicely there. You have a bunch of blocks which are independent of one another, and so you can analyze each block independently of one another, and you get some statistics, global statistics of the, the distribution of the singular values. And uh, <coughs> from singular values, you get some inequalities on the eigenvalues. So, so far, the only result, a rigorous result we, we could get, uh, is that <coughs> when you take the large M limit, so you take a larger, larger and larger such matrices, you find that. Uh, there are not many eigenvalues, they can statistically with high probability, so WHP means with high probability, you cannot have many eigenvalues uh, close to the origin, which are small, okay? So more, which means that <coughs> here the statement is that with high probability, the number of eigenvalues smaller than R, for R small, is itself smaller than uh, C times R times M. M is the dimension of the full matrix. So it's a small, small fraction, it has to be a small fraction of this uh, proportion of this, uh, of this big, uh, big matrix, okay? So this is the type of result. We don't have an asymptotic distribution of the spectrum of this matrix, but this is a, let's say, a first, first result. We know that there there's no kernel. Typically, uh, generically, this matrix doesn't have a kernel. Uh, it has a non-trivial kernel. It does, not, it does not have a non-trivial kernel. And also, it does not have an accumulation of uh, small eigenvalues close to the origin. Okay. So this is sufficient to give us a lower bound uh, for this fractal value, okay, that is a low bound about how many eigenvalues are non-small. Non not small. Okay. So <coughs> we want, we would like to, to know more about this, uh, about this, uh, the density of uh, eigenvalues. Okay. Again, the plots are very bad. I'm sorry. I don't know what happens. So <coughs> we would be interested to have some information about this empirical measure. Okay. Empirical measure is just uh, the sum over a delta function on the eigenvalues. Okay. Of this uh, random matrix. And the question is, does this empirical measure converge to something when m is large uh, with high probability? Okay, this type of question people are asking in random matrix theory. So <coughs> uh, this we did some, some numerics already some time ago, and this is what you see. Okay, for one one instance of such random matrix, I think it was for uh, m is equal to four thousand or something like this. You see that uh, there seems to be a rather regular distribution of the eigenvalues. There seems to be a hole here. Okay, it's a bit strange. And they are they are cont contained in some uh, they are contained in some uh, in some uh, disk inside some disk. Okay, and here this was supposed to be uh, this was to be, uh, yes this was to be st supposed to be a counting function from here. Okay? Count the number of eigenvalues which are smaller than uh, than R. Okay, so uh, and this stops this starts here. This should be at the beginning. There should be some zero here, and then it starts to grow up to up to one. Okay, yeah. this is the rescaled counting function of eigenvalues smaller or equal to R as a function of R. So you see there is some regularity, there are several curves here due to the, the fact that we use several dimensions. We, lo we, lo we look at, at matrices uh, of several, uh, a certain number of dimensions and each time we, s we, we, we draw them randomly several times. We draw the phases randomly uh, several times, several times. Okay. So it looks like there is an asymptotic smooth density, but we don't know yet, <coughs> at least we don't know yet what to think about this smooth density. Okay. So <coughs> I mean the plots look much better on the computer than on the screen. So. Strange, <coughs> yes. So let's do it. Let's try now to do it for different different numbers of n, okay, which are not powers of three. So you don't have anymore this uh, this uh, tensor product structure. So then the graph is a bit more complicated. When you try to extract 
So when you try to extract the graph and the strongly connected component from the graph, it's, uh, it's less regular. It's not, only, it's not always very regular. So here I just give an example where n is the, after, after 9 you have n equal to 12, okay, so which is not power of 3, obviously. And you see that the, the strongly connected component, the matrix reduced to the strongly connected component, has this structure, okay, which is a bit like the one before, but it is less regular. Okay, we have some bunches of here with three, three, uh, <coughs> three elements, then one element, one element, then three elements. Okay, so it is a bit uh, less regular, but it still has, uh, let's say, the uh, same type of shape. And uh, what is nice is that this, when you take r times r star, that is when you try to compute the singular values of this guy it is still block diagonal. You still have this block diagonal property, but now the blocks are of different sizes. Okay, they're not always of size two as before. So, <coughs> uh, <coughs> so I, this is where my, my the, second, the second student, uh, master student who was working on it, uh, Justin Trias, okay, he worked a bit on this, on this setting when we don't have this tensor product. So what he, sh what he showed is that there is, still, uh, there is still a large kernel or generalized kernel, the non-trivial spectrum, that is the size, the maximal, size of uh, the non-null columns after you take uh, powers of the matrix by itself has size of order n to the new, so with same fractal exponent, okay? So this will give us the upper bound for the fractal by law. That is, uh, we have a large kernel and this, what is outside of the kernel, what is the non-trivial eigenvalues, they have at most this, 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 uh, this dimension, okay? They cover a space which has at most this dimension. This comes just from the topology of the graph. And what he showed is that there is always a large strongly connected component, okay, of size uh, about the same size, okay, n to the new, <coughs> not necessarily with the same prefactor, but okay. Plus, sometimes there is a small or say a small strongly connected component uh, sitting by, okay. And if we apply, so we did not work out, we did not work out the details at that time because it was the end of his uh, internship, and I went to do something else. But I'm pretty sure now that one can show for this 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 generalization that we can also show that uh, there is a non-trivial spectrum of size n to the new okay so we will get we would get in this way we would get uh, uh, this form of uh, fractal by law with an asymptotic okay this is just that is a number of non-trivial eigenvalues that larger than r would be asymptotic to n to the new but without a precise without a precise uh, no <coughs> knowledge of what is the constant what is the c of r how does this depend on r on this uh, on this size so this student also did a, a few numerics. Well, he computed actually the spectrum of all the matrices from 300 to, uh, yes, <coughs> 9,300. Okay. He did it without, uh, without my uh, knowledge somehow. He liked to play uh, with machines. And he plotted all the counting functions. So now uh, he counts functions in the other way. That is, he counts the number of eigenvalues larger than R. Okay. Okay. Well, so you get each color corresponds to a specific values of M. Okay. So you see that all these curves, and he rescaled, he rescaled by the uh, by this n to the new, or by, by, by this, uh, this formula. <coughs> Here we scale by the, the dimension of the smaller, of, this, of the reduced matrix, okay? which is what you should do. And he, find, he found this type of curse. So up to a, a little rescaling by factor between one and two, okay? up to such a rescaling, he found some, well, some general shape, which could look like, a, let's say, a tendency to be a, a universal shape, or I don't know how to int interpret it. Okay, but still, we could still be confident that what we found for specific values n equal to two, 3 to the k could still hold, could still be true for this uh, more, more general setting. Okay. But we would like to understand what, what could be this asymptotic uh, shape or profile function. Okay, into how, how, does this, uh, how does this distribution of eigenvalues depend on r? Okay, what could be this profile, profile function? So <coughs> to investigate this, somehow the, the only idea I came up across would be to uh, to generalize the setting and to allow the, the geometry of the graph to change also, to be also randomized in some way, okay? But I don't randomize the big one because the, I don't take a, a general, general directed graph on, on n nodes, but I want to randomize the small one, which is this, uh, this uh, strongly connected component, okay, in some sense. So this d tilde m, which has already a dimension m of the order of n to the new, and <coughs> which, because I cannot, I cannot have a direct, I, I cannot have access on the, on this, uh, on the, uh, spectral, spectral uh, distribution for this matrix for this specific skeleton. How about considering a general, more general uh, problem that is, which co consists in uh, looking at directed graphs uh, with m nodes, okay, which, which, with some rules, okay. So <coughs> what we observed is that for the reduced graph we encountered, all the nodes had, uh, as I, uh, I just showed two examples, all the nodes had either two incoming and two outgoing, uh, two outgoing points or two incoming and one outgoing and two incoming and three outgoing. 
Okay, this was the three examples, the three examples I had, okay, for the, the type of reduced matrices. Okay, so <coughs> let's look at, for instance, so the idea would be to look at the types of, uh, at the family of directed graphs, okay, which I call GD, where you impose a certain distribution of degrees, okay, a certain distribution of, uh, of, uh, of these guys, uh, distribution of these guys and these guys, okay, and this would be encoded in uh, this type of vector, okay, for each node, you decide that this node will be uh, of this type, this node num number two will be of this type, num number three will be of this type, etc., up to node number n. So you fix the distribution of, de of by degrees, okay, and now you connect them as you want, okay, any way to connect these things, to connect these half, half edges to another half edge, okay. So this way, there's a way to construct a, a family of random directed graphs, okay, which would correspond to any permutation between these, these half edges, okay. And we, put, we, we just put, a <coughs> we can view it now as a random graph with specified, uh, specified uh, degrees, distribution of degrees. Okay. <coughs> so in this way, you can, well, of course, when n becomes large, th there's a large, a large way to choose the, the to choose the uh, uh, the permutation between the half edges. So there's a large set of directed graphs with the same the same uh, distribution of uh, of, uh <coughs> of degrees. Okay. So now we will we want to to use this model for the smaller, for the reduced graph corresponding to the strongly connected uh, component. Okay. And above this random choice of uh, reduced graph, we also, we still want to put the random phases. Okay. So we add the random phases uh, on each of the, non each of the, each of the links, okay. each of the edges. <coughs> so this way we, on, we obtain a, an ensemble of random matrices in this, in this set. Okay. So <coughs> this would be a, let's say a model to try to investigate. And uh, well, there has been some very little results about this in the probability uh, uh, community. So <coughs> we would really understand, I would like to understand the spectral behavior, the spectral distribution of these matrices, okay, uh, this type of random matrices with random phases sitting on uh, random graphs, or at least uh, some family of random graphs. So there has been some, some results about uh, the topology, the structure of these random graphs, okay, because we did not impose it to be a, a strongly connected component. But fortunately, it was proved about uh, 15 years ago but that <coughs> uh, if you put some, some uh, constraint on, the, uh, on, the, on these degrees, okay, <coughs> then with, with high probability, this random graph will be strongly connected. It will be a, there will be a single strongly connected component in the graph and all edges will be, will be connected to other edges. And uh, uh, if you relax a bit uh, this, condition <coughs> this condition, that is, if you allow, if you allow some of the uh, degrees to be equal to one, like we had here, for instance, okay, this, we had the degree one, so if you allow some of these degree one, uh, out, out degree one edges, you still have a high chance to be a strongly connected component, or the graph has a, a large a macroscopic strongly connected component. Okay. So these are, let's say, topological, uh, as topological facts about this, this family of random graphs. And <coughs> well, as far as I know, there is no direct, there is no general, uh, general uh, uh, study of uh, the spectrum of this, uh, even the spectrum of the adjacent symmetrices, so there is a conjecture which you can find in a paper in 2012 by Bordenave and Shafai, who in some, in some uh, end remarks, okay, they, they listed in some open problems. And above, <coughs> above these open problems, they, they, uh, they made a conjecture about the spectral distribution, the asymptotic spectral distribution for the adjacent symmetric, okay, well, so when you put ones everywhere, for these type of uh, random graphs. Okay. In the case where these graphs are uh, d-regular, meaning that uh, each edge has exactly d outgoing uh, uh, each, each uh, node has d outgoing uh, edges and d incoming edges. Okay, so the d regular digraphs, and they conjecture this formula. Okay, so <coughs> whatever it comes from, so it came from. For I discussed with uh, with them. Okay, it comes from uh, from uh, free probabilities. Okay, the theory of free probabilities. There's a way to to guess or to make uh, let's say guesses about what could be the spectral distribution, the asymptotic spectral distribution of uh, of such random graphs. Okay, call it a complex uh, keston mckay measure by uh, so this is a, this is a, let's say a complex gener a direct graph generalization of of the the Keston Mackay measure, which is uh, corresponds to the the, <coughs> the spectral asymptotic spectral distribution for the random uh, d-regular uh, non-oriented graphs. Okay, so d is the d is just the number of outgoing edges and number of incoming edges. So if you do the plot, so this <coughs> I did it recently, so I did not uh, I did not put it unfortunately uh, unfortunately on the on the directly on the same plot as the, 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 the one uh, by, by Gendron. So this was the plot, the distribution for this uh, random phase model uh, for, the di for, the, for the De Bruyne graph, okay? And here this would be uh, the proposition, 
okay, of the distribution of uh, the spectral distribution of the, the, the counting function for the uh, <coughs> for this model where d is equal to two. Okay, when you have two edges coming in, two edges coming out, so which, which should correspond to this one here. So here the topology is fixed. Okay, it's given by this De Bruyne graph. Here the topology is random. Okay, and I looked at the but the, the, there's no phases. Here the topology is fixed. There are phases, random phases. Here the topology is random. Okay, in this model, and uh, the phases are equal to one everywhere. Okay. And somehow there's a, well, somehow a similitude between the two uh, counting functions. Okay. And uh, in particular, for instance, here you don't see it on the plot, but here somehow the spectral distribution stops at a value which is equal to square root 2. Okay. Square root 2. And here, this is exactly what you find here. The, the spectral distribution uh, jumps, I mean, not jumps, but uh, grows until square root 2, and then it stops. There is no eigenvalue anymore. Okay. And when you look at, if you look back at my, my picture, this picture here, uh, this circle here, where the, the ra spectral radius is really about square root 2. Okay. So <coughs> maybe, okay, so my, my conjecture, let's say, I would say, or maybe it's, uh, would be that here we randomize the, the, we randomize the, uh, the connectivity, we randomize the, the topology of the graph, but there is no phase. Here we, we had the fixed graph, but we randomized the phase. And maybe uh, somehow the two types of randomization Give you the same, give you the same distribution would be uh, would be like this, which would be like this in the case of uh, when we have uh, always the same connectivity. Okay. So that's the type of conjecture which uh, one can make. <coughs> so <coughs> I was a bit fast. <coughs> so I just okay, I just want to wanted to to, to show you uh, a type of models, okay, very simple models of uh, graphs which came out uh, the study of quantum. Uh, or let's say quantized chaotic systems and some questions which came up, up which came across uh, uh, when studying the spectral uh, spectral properties of quantized chaotic systems and in particular this quantum quantized maps okay this specific quantum map and from this from this model we drew a second model a model of uh, which could be interpreted as a model of <coughs> graph with some phases so it's a big graph directed graph with some phases so uh, Somehow, the, 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 to obtain uh, the fact, the reason why we obtained this fractal by law was really due to the very specific topology of this graph, okay, to the fact that the, the, the strongly connected component was very small compared to the big size, okay, because it was, a, it was a, the, the big size to a power new and new was smaller than one. Okay, so this is where this uh, fractal by law was coming from. And then I proposed to you a model of putting random phases and investigating the spectral distribution of these this random, uh, random phase matrices. Okay. So, <coughs> uh, well, what I could say is that this, this and then in, this, in, uh, in the last part, I described a, a random graph model where we impose the specify, when we, we impose uh, the distribution of the degrees, of the by degrees, and in most of the, in the examples which I had, the, the, these degrees were bounded. So it corresponds to a scarce, a scarce, uh, scarce uh, directed graph <coughs> above which we put random phases. Okay. So in this direction, so this, this spectral question has not been uh, so far uh, investigated rigorously, but uh, I hope that maybe the presence of these random phases should make the analysis easier okay, that in, than in the case of uh, uh, looking at the adjacency matrices, okay, because there's more averaging than if you, then when there's more averaging, somehow the, the, the objects which you look at are, are easier to, to, to study from a probability point of view. I want to mention that one student of Bordenaf, Cost, uh, has studied the statistics of the largest eigenvalue of this uh, random adjacency matrices, not the first eigenvalue. The first eigenvalue is always given by, will be given by the number of, uh, by the degree, which was equal to two, here in this case. But when you look at the second eigenvalue, somehow uh, you find that there are many eigenvalues uh, of the same order, okay, and, the, and this order would be about uh, square root two. So somehow there's a, I expect that maybe the, the second eigenvalues of, of uh, appearing for this, for this, uh, for, for the adjacency matrix would be of the same order of the rest of the spectrum of these adjacency, random adjacency matrix would be similar to what happens when you randomize uh, over the, the phases. Okay. And to finish, I just want to say, of course, we looked at examples which were depending, which were built on a single, very simple, uh, very simple map on the unit interval, open map on the unit interval. We could do the same, one could do the same, try to do the same for all other types of expanding maps. Okay. Expanding means that uh, the, the <coughs> Uh, maps for which the for which the, the 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 slope is larger than one. Okay, because somehow this was this was important in in the in the fact in the structure of the matrices. So the fact that these these tilted diagonals are, 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 are steep enough. Okay, they're not they're not close to the diagonal. They're, they're steeper than the diagonal. And this corresponds to the fact that the map the initial map q goes to three q 
has a slope larger than one. Okay. All right. So thank you for your attention. Thank you. <laughs> questions? In some cases, uh, you, you can deduce the um, distribution of the of, of, of the spectrum from the distribution of the singular uh, values. values, and uh, by some there is a, in some special cases. Yes, there's a trick which call uh, which they call hermitization. Mm -hmm. The single ring theorem. Yes, you, you, and. Um, uh, for instance, in the in the last uh, in, in the case of the uh, in, uh, just two slides before it's when you ah, yes. <laughs> it's not the usual uh, <laughs> okay. uh, the, uh, about the, the complex question uh, Mackey distribution yes uh, you can uh, it's probable. Probably that you can get uh, the distribution of the singular values of this uh, mm -hmm. directed. Yes. Uh, of, of yes. This directed mm -hmm. right? and and uh, when you compute it and that you make the make it a rotationally uh, invariant. invariant mm -hmm. then do you? I don't expect the distribution of the singular values to be just to be the same as the uh, distribution of eigenvalues. I mean, I don't think they're the same. You have, you have inequalities between uh, you have inequalities between distribution of eigenvalues and distribution of singular values, but in general you don't have uh, the distribution yeah, do not match each other. Uh, imagine that inside this circle, uh, um, mm. intensity is. Uh, I know that in, not in in the in the in the study of random uh, random complex matrices like the Gini ensemble or things like this, people try to transform the problem uh, the spectral problem for. Uh, random complex matrix into uh, looking at the spectral problem for a certain uh, self-adjoint matrix. So there's a procedure called hermitization. Yeah, okay, yeah. hermitization. Mm -hmm. And uh, okay, so I didn't try it uh, for these matri for these matrices here because uh, it requires you require some some uh, some estimates about the probability that to have a Wait, that so this. Two, two by two blocks. Yes, for the two by two blocks. Yes, this 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 is I guess what you can what you can get for the two two by two blocks is a bit better probably maybe a bit better than what I wrote uh, in my statements, but uh, in my statement I was interested in avoiding accumulation of small eigenvalues close to close to zero. Okay, I, w I wanted to avoid to show that this was not possible statistically. This was not happening. Okay, but this does not give me the distribution. This does not give me the asymptotic distribution of eigenvalues. It just tells me that there are not too many. It gives me a uh, let's say a low bound for, for, for the eigenvalues in the sense that they cannot accumulate statistically, they cannot accumulate near the origin. But uh, as so far, at least the way I used the singular values was through the <coughs> using, using the value inequalities, which connect uh, sums of eigenvalues to sums of singular values. And this can give me the t this type of uh, lower, lower bound. But to get an asymptotic, I mean to get a convergence to some asymptotic distribution, uh, okay, one has to do something else. But <coughs> I, I do have one mm -hmm. uh, about the uh, result by Cooper and Fries that he used. Mm -hmm. So you said that if some degrees are one, yes, then you still have a strongly connected component. But how many of the of the nodes in the induced subgraph still have that degree? Uh, uh, I don't know. Because maybe when you reduce to the strongly connected components, mm -hmm. you lose all the guys that have. That had degree one. But here, degree ma one means that I can have uh, one out and one in. So okay. I mean, th these edges they're not isolated. They're not. Uh, uh, they are not. Uh, how do you say? Uh, uh, no ways. You can still having degree one means that yeah, I can yeah, have. Yeah, a they may not be part of the strong connection. Yes, that's right. That's right. Yes, it could be also outside. Okay. <coughs> but uh, I think in the result, actually, you could have a positive fraction of such degrees. Okay. Okay. This and you you would still have a big uh, connected. Okay. So I guess you, you we'll necessarily we'll will have some here. of them inside, yes. Thanks. Okay, th thank you. Thank Welcome. You